Hi, welcome to another poorly produced podcast. Today we'll be taking a look at The Visitor from the Future. The Visitor from the Future, or as it's known in French, Le Visiteur du Futur, is a French sci fi comedy web series created by Francois de Crac in 2009 and is a favorite of mine. This is in no small part because I grew up with it, but also for other reasons we'll get into later. Before any further development, I have to mention that the entirety of the series is available with English subtitles on YouTube. I discovered the series when I was in 7th grade, binge-watched the first and second seasons, quickly fell in love with it and, as a lot of kids of that age do, forgot about it as fast as I got into it. Till around a year and a half later, when the friend that had introduced me to the series dropped in the middle of a conversation that a third season had been available for a while. So I updated myself on that, and this season became my favorite one so far. And once again, I completely forgot about it in three weeks' time. And then another year and a half later, I learned about the fourth season, watched it, and felt a little bit underwhelmed. I didn't really know why at the time, but this season had not lived up to my expectations. Maybe they were too high, maybe the fact that this was the final season saddened me enough to dislike it. I didn't really care back then. But recently, after many years, I rewatched the whole series and felt exactly the same. Besides, I learned that a movie is being shot. As of this taping, the editing is done. Having grown, become more self-aware and more analytical, I wanted to try to answer this question. Why is the fourth season the weakest? Season 4, or as the official title goes, Neo Versailles, is quite different from the other seasons. The most striking departure from previous seasons is the choice to set the majority of the story in the future, whereas in other seasons, most of the scenes took place in the present day. This time, 2014 scenes are quite few and far between. They're relegated to the first and last episode and to mid- and post-credits scenes. They obviously were scenes set in the future as soon as episode 16, season 1, and even a huge chunk of the third season took place in the 26th century. However, all of these scenes, except a handful in the last episode of the third season, were shot inside. In the third season's making of, François' desire to shoot scenes set in the future outside blatantly shows through. I personally read the choice to set the majority of the scenes from season 4 in the future and in an open environment as the result of the frustration of having done it only once at the end of the previous season. I might go out on a limb here, but to me it cannot be the result of having a bigger budget this time. If anything, it is the cause of the bigger budget. First, because both the third and fourth seasons were co-produced by Ankama Production and France Télévisions, with the participation of the French National Center of Cinematography. Second, because, as I just said, it is almost painfully obvious, even back in season three, that François wanted to take his series outside. The problem I have with this decision is simple. The future doesn't appear as frightening anymore. You don't get as big a sense of threat or decay as in the other seasons. You don't feel like humans have to live like rats, hidden, scattered and desperate. Yes, they still consider cat food a luxury, but with everything being so bright and large, you don't buy the post-apocalyptic aspect of the story. Another issue I have with the plot of Neo Versailles is that, unlike previous seasons, the plot revolves around the MacGuffin, the Queen's necklace. Granted, the inciting incident is Raph looking for closure and hoping to find it by speaking one last time with the visitor, but this motivation is quickly brushed aside to be replaced by the quest for the Queen's necklace. If you look at the bigger picture, 
the whole season feels like a sidestep from the story told in the rest of the series, namely the visitor's quest to save the future. With a bit of bad faith sprinkled in, you could even go as far as calling it a filler season. That is not to say that it wasn't the logical payoff to a previous setup. At the end of the third season, the visitor realized that he only put others in danger, so he decided to retire from the missions and leave. Plus, he trusted the missionaries with Constance as their boss to take up the torch. So it's only fitting that in this season the focus isn't on the global story, but more on the characters. But you still get the sense that it's not the high point of our hero's adventure, almost like in the second Indiana Jones movie. But unlike in Indiana Jones 2, there is character growth in this season. The most predictable arc being the visitor's one. I say predictable because as soon as the first episode, when you see that he's still hung up on Judith's death and reluctant to save the world, you know that at the end he'll be done grumping, get his mojo back and ride off into the sunset, ready to save the future, yada yada yada. He also gets a second arc, more or less connected to the first one, where he realizes that Straight up abandoning his friends is super hurtful, and being honest is the best way not to hurt them. What I don't buy in this arc is neither its beginning nor its end, but the middle. As he keeps doing evening shows in Neo Versailles and becomes the Queen's champion, the visitor becomes obnoxious and terribly selfish. But to me, it all comes super fast in only a singular montage, and goes away as, if not way more quickly than it came, which results in the arc not feeling organic at all. Compare this to the relationship between Henry and the Baroness. This arc is developed over several episodes, the growth of their relationship is shown through multiple instances, which leaves it room to breathe and therefore not come across as forced by the screenplay. It is, to me, the best one of the season. It might be the reason why, unlike with other actors, I do not have a problem with Céline Tran being cast as the Baroness. You see, there's a great deal of actors in this season that happen to be famous. Not like major Hollywood star famous, but they were famous at least on the French internet at the time. It wasn't new in this series by any means. Simon Astier was cast back in season 3 and Ludovic was cast all the way back in season 2. But here the extent of the casting of celebrities was huge. This time around, seven of them were in the cast. The three ones I previously mentioned, Céline Tran, Simon Astier and Ludovic, Benjamin Daniel, a.k.a. Benzai, Nicolas Bernot, Florent Bernard, a.k.a. Flaubert, and Vanessa Brias. The first time I watched the season, I only knew Benzai's solo work, but nonetheless, I had the strong feeling that the actors playing were famous and that I had to recognize them. I wouldn't be able to explain why, though, but what's certain is that I didn't saw characters, I saw actors. It is especially true for the last three of them. I guess it is another reason why I wasn't as into the atmosphere as with previous seasons. Speaking of the atmosphere, there are a lot of what could appear as minor details that change in this season, but that, at least to me, end up truly transforming the whole watching experience. The first one, literally the first thing in every episode, is the previously sequence. Even if it starts with Slimane Baptiste's voice saying Previously, in Le Visiteur du Futur. As we were used to since episode 13, season 1, it segues to the episode with a big ta da 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 that <laughs> tries so hard to be ultra epic and to hype up the audience for the episode that it feels terribly hollow. In a very similar manner, at the end of every episode, the logo of the season is presented. 
It is a huge semi-circular logo that deploys itself as if it was a steampunk machine, which is perfectly in sync with the costumes and the sets, but falls a bit flat for the same reason as the end of the opening sequence. And finally, there's the reason that inspired me to do this whole episode. In the entire season, at the notable exception of a montage in episode 4, there is no song by any of François Descraques' friends or acquaintances. You see, in seasons 2 and 3, the credits would always roll to an original song by either one of the actors, or a band he played in, or even acquaintances of François. There would also be scenes, here and there, set to some of those original songs. But this time there is only one, as I mentioned. A montage on the song What a Day by Minivag. Which means no song by the lovely Ritters, no song by Mix Bizarre, and worst of all, no song by Florent Dorin. I'm going to go on a quick tangent here to recommend that you check Florent's music channel out, but most importantly to explain why the absence of Florent Dorin from the soundtrack is such a big deal. The first time I was introduced to his music was on the last episode of season 2. Picture this. As the credits roll, accompanied by behind-the-scenes photos, a bittersweet music plays, which is only fitting because the season's over and so is the story. Or so I thought at the time. Same goes for the end of season 3, and this time it really feels like the whole story is over. And at the time, even François thought so. That's why it is so tragic to me that Florent's music wasn't included in this season, because this time it was actually the end. Except that now there's the movie, but you know. To an even larger scale, it is strikingly revealing to me of the biggest issue with this season. You see, when I listened to the rest of Florent's music, I thought to myself, and I still do today when I listen to it from time to time, I thought to myself, whoa, this is both tremendously touching and feels really personal. You truly get the sense that it was homemade. You know, it was amateurish, and I'm putting enormous air quotes here, yet it motivated me to create because it showed me that I could achieve something this good by myself. I now know that it is tremendously touching because it feels personal. And I feel the same way about Florent Dorin's music as I feel about the first three seasons of The Visitor from the Future. It exhilarates me into creating stuff because it's so great and yet it remains human-sized or at least it feels so. I think that at the end of the day, the fourth season just failed to recapture the homemade vibe of the rest of the series. I guess it was unavoidable if you factor in the growth of the series. It is truly transparent in the fourth season's making of. You really get the sense that the production jumped up in scale and that it's no longer three friends filming together on their weekends. Even the making of themselves have followed this evolution. When in the first seasons there would be almost one making of per episode, and it would go like, okay, so Florence doing his own makeup in the bathroom, and Raph has just finished his scenes, so he's going to take care of the lights now. Here you have four or five minutes long videos in which you see that there is a whole team of set decorators that have been working on set for almost a month before anyone else showed up and that they have five different types of light projectors, a tremendous array of batteries, etc, etc. It is almost demoralizing. That's why I'm quite ambivalent when it comes to the movie. On the one hand, I'm super excited to see the sequel to a story I love. And on the other hand, I dread this feeling of underwhelming and creative impotence. Of course, all of this is not to say that the whole season is bad. 
I'll say it again, but I just wanted to focus on the parts that didn't feel as smooth to me in order to understand why I wasn't as fond of this season as the three others. I'm really looking forward to seeing the movie, and I trust that no matter the outcome, it will be worthwhile.